Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. Apologies that we're starting a little bit later than we planned. Um, Thursday, between 4 and 5, the South African Bar Association hosts a speaker or deal with a, a legal topic intended to assist young practitioners um, with training and development and uh, to feed into the core values that we hold as an organization. Today's speaker is no stranger to us in the sense that she's been a practicing advocate, uh, one of the leading experts when it comes to medical negligence and medical law, um, advocate uh, Maud Letzler. She will be speaking on, uh, her topic today will be about when do we die? It's not the religious topic, it's in fact a legal topic. <laughs> I, uh, I, <laughs> I must confess, Maud, when I saw the topic initially, the title of the topic, it struck me as a religious issue dealt with by a legal person, but you will allay such fears in your presentation. Yeah. After Maud's presentation, you'll be asking us some questions uh, from a, a, um, within her field. She is part of a group of advocates called Synergy and uh, Innovation Legal, a, a forward-thinking group of advocates. Um, whom we have the, the benefit of working with and will be working with and collaborating with. So with much further ado, I'm introducing you to Advocate Maud Letzler. Thank you guys. Um, yes, I think the topic of the article came about from um, what actually was what the doctors in this particular situation found problematic. So I'll quickly give you a brief um, background uh, for those of you who haven't read um, the article online on my LinkedIn page. But basically I was asked in December by one of the senior counsel in uh, Pretoria to please do research for him for a doctor in a hospital that he was representing that had a difficult position in that one um, of their patients who they have found to be dead in the medical sense. Uh, the family um, withdrew their consent to remove the patient from the ventilator. And this was as we were going through um, a second wave of COVID and ventilators were in really short supply. So even though the doctors had the authority given to them by the National Health Act, um, as well as the guidance by the Health Professions Council's Code of Good Conduct, um, they wanted to ensure that it doesn't come back to bite them. So they brought an application in the High Court um, for which we then did the research of when are you actually dead, so to speak, and, or passed on. Dead is such a harsh, harsh word. Um, this uh, topic was something that I've previously researched in that um, it's a very interesting factor, factor of brain injury and a lot of us that um, deal in clinical negligence would have come across um, the injuries to the brain during birth, during cerebral palsy. So the delicacy of the brain has always been something that's interested me. So what I found uh, when I started researching this is that nationally um, and internationally, there is an adherence to a specific um, standard when they determine brain death. Um, and this was all uh, discussed in detail in the article, but I'll go through it with you briefly. There's basically papers written all over the world that once you have reached a stage where your brain stem no longer functions, I wish I'd brought a picture with me, then I could have shown you. But those of you that deal with cerebral palsy matters would know that the, um, the doctors like to refer to your reptilian brain, which is the brain that starts, um, starts off um, regulating your functions as a young baby and then or as a neonate. And if that reptilian brain is trying to survive, it starts affecting the rest of the brain, which then causes the fallout later on if it's short of oxygen. In um, 
a brain injury for an adult, if it's starved of oxygen, almost exactly the same thing happens. In other words, there's flares in your brain and at first you can't see it immediately. And when you read the article, you will, I can't remember if I put all those details in in the background, but when the doctors first took the patient in, um, she was taken in despite not having a medical aid uh, by, the, uh, by a private health facility because it was an emergency and that constitutionally they should do and then stabilize a patient before moving them on. So, um, so they then uh, start caring for her based on the fact that she needed to be resuscitated um, and she needed to be cared for. As time passed on, within that week, they realized that um, her reactions were slowing down. She had shown signs of a particular type of diabetes, which is an indication that your body is shutting down. So they took um, that as a sign that they might be brain death and they took her for further scans and the further scans then indicated that uh, that was indeed the case. It looked like her brainstem basically wasn't um, providing the necessary signals to the rest of the brain to keep her alive, which meant that the only thing that was keeping her alive was the machine. Mm. Now, um, if you have a living will, I think that is something I touched on in the article as well. If you have a living will, you will put in a living will that you don't want to be resuscitated or you can say you're okay with being resuscitated but you don't want to be kept on machines. So obviously then it makes it easier for medical health facilities and also for your family if you are in a serious incident to make that decision to take you off a machine. Because at the end of the day, and this was the struggle this family had, they did not understand that um, she was actually in all uh, clinical senses uh, deceased already and that the fact that her heart was so beating um, did not indicate um, that she was alive um, and that the machine was breathing for her. So, um, so that was taken out of the doctor's hands when, um, before the application was heard and that's why we don't have a case that we can go and research on this. She passed away on the Monday from a heart attack, which eventually does happen uh, with some of these patients in that their bodily functions gradually start, um, start giving in or stop working and functioning properly. But their concern was, was that um, the doctors were literally killing her. So, you know, if they switch off the machine, um, she would be dead by virtue of the fact that the machine is switched off rather than the fact that she was in actual fact already deceased um, in all clinical types of senses. And um, they at first understood, but then they went back to the family and came back and said it's against their religious principles. And they were also concerned about a claim they had against the road accident fund. And I think that's where the misunderstanding came in because I thought if the hospital and the doctors are killing her, how are they going to be able to claim um, from the road accident fund because the, the road accident fund will turn around and say, but you know, she died because the doctors turned the machines off and she wasn't actually dead. Can you imagine the costs for the road accident fund for that two weeks alone was half a million rand already to um, while this fight was now going on. So, um, so if they had made the decision and left it in the patient's hands and there were sufficient ventilators, because also none of the public health facilities wanted to take her. When uh, the family decided that they want to keep her on the ventilator, um, they tried to find her a suitable public health facility where the family would not be burdened with any costs and they all refused because they were all full, they were all overburdened, there were no ventilators available. So then it becomes not just a moral but an ethical issue as well, because do you adhere to somebody's religious principles of not turning off a ventilator or the wishes of the family, or do you start looking around you at all the other patients? And if you look at what our constitution says, we are only entitled to reasonable health care. We are not entitled to the very possible, best possible health care, which would include being kept on a ventilator as long as the family feels it's necessary for you to be there. 
So the hospital in this case have done anything reasonably possible. So the reasonable healthcare in this case, that we shifted the argument around. In other words, it was no longer a question of her getting reasonable healthcare because there was no doubt that she was. But it was all the other patients that were being deprived of a ventilator whose lives could be saved, who now constitu whose constitutional rights were being infringed on. Because we forget that the constitution gives us a right and a responsibility. So, um, and then the question came in, did she have any rights left? She couldn't make any decisions for herself. Um, she couldn't say yay or nay. And would she, if she had been alive, wanted to live like that? Mm -hmm. Where she has been forced to breathe with that mm -hmm. pipe down her throat. And technically she's passed on. She can't um, be buried. Uh, she can't go through all the necessary family rituals and um, all the things necessary to make her rest in peace. And those of you who read the article earlier on would see that one of the comments at the time thought that I was in the wrong because um, it was God's purpose. Uh, it was God who had to decide if she should live or die, um, which I think was not what this case was about. So then we get to, to the actual issue of brainstem death. And brainstem death is very interesting in that there are very specific tests they do for, with that. So, um, like test, um, you'll know in the movies, you will have might have seen watching Grey's Anatomy or any of the other shows where they shine the light in your eye. But they also test your ears, they test your reflexes. It's a whole host of tests that have to be done. And what these doctors did, even before they informed the family, they went through all those different tests to make sure that this patient was clinically dead. And if she was clinically dead, I could then go to the family and say, this is the current situation. So um, my concern was, and still is, that this case might in any event still come back and bite the doctors. And I might still get, and the hospital, they might still get reported to the Health Professions Council for unprofessional conduct um, in the manner in which they have run this matter, even though they have gone out of their way um, to protect themselves and to do the right thing. So this is the thing about medical negligence and for all of you that do clinical negligence who are interested in clinical negligence, there's often, um, I've always said that I don't like doing matrimonial and labor law yet, I do do it because it's so personal. <laughs> Um, because you know they always want to kill each other. The, the employer and the employee want to kill each other, the husband and wife want to kill each other, you know, it's just too much emotion. But then you get the clinical negligence and it's exactly the same scenario, especially when you are sitting as a defendant with a tiny little baby who was um, born uh, deprived of oxygen, had hypoxic ischemia, or in this case somebody who was in a motor vehicle accident. And you might ask yourself, how did it happen in the first place that somebody has that um, comp type of a compromised brain? All kinds of stuff can happen. Your body is absolutely incredible. And that's why it's so easy for some things to go wrong and why complications happen. If we, our blood pressure is too high, if we bleed too much, if we are on too much pain, it has an effect on our brain. Just think those of you who get migraines, for instance, when you have a migraine, you can think of nothing else. That pain absolutely absorbs your entire being. Mothers who've been in labor, I mean, yeah, there's like nothing that stands anywhere close to you is seen or heard because it's just such a concentration on that moment of pain. So, so when pain takes over your body, or in this case, she might have had a lack of oxygen, she might have gone um, into, um, uh, she might have been unconscious, um, and most likely in a traumatic injury, she might have had a very hard hit on her brain, um, a hematoma, which might have um, taken up space in her brain, might have killed off some of the nerve endings, and in the process might have compromised um, her, um, her whole processes. But it was clear that as the process went on, even though she got the best possible care, that um, she still um, did not survive, which is absolutely tragic. But yeah, so, um, so yeah, if you want to go and read all the different tests that the doctors um, would like to do, um, they were neurologists, they were cardiologists, they were all kinds, they, the list goes on forever and ever. So this lady got the best, best possible care um, before the decision was made 
that clinically she was deceased. Um, so yeah, if you have to deal with a matter like this in your practice, um, I would suggest first of all that you look at the National Health Act. Um, very few people that do um, any type of medical negligence or clinical negligence work have ever to look at, the, at that act. Um, if you deal with medical aids especially, please go and look at that act. They, um, there's important factors there that's not always taken into consideration with medical aid claims. Then the Health Professions Council's Code of Good Conduct, all of this is av available online and it's free of charge. Um, the HBCSA has a code of good conduct, there's an ethical code, there are various codes that doctors follow very strictly. Um, if you had read uh, Popia, um, which I'm sure all of you had by now, you would notice that the guidelines that they provide for doctors in how they need to protect patients' um, privacy was almost incorporated directly into Popia. So, um, so the doctors have for a long time already been doing this, where they protect patients' privacy. And then uh, there is the patient's rights charter, something also that very few people in our industry that do medical negligence know about. And there is the patient's rights charter is especially important for mothers with babies because it sets specific guidelines for how mothers and their children have to be treated in public health facilities in particular. Um, so yeah, so there's a whole host of things you can go and look at and then use your Google or Firefox, whatever you use as a search engine. There's hosts and hosts of articles available on um, social media on this topic. There's lots written about brain stem death, how it happens, the tests that have to be done. And I think the comf comforting thing for us in our research, research in this case was that Every single country, be it the USA, be it Canada, be it the UK, there were similar tests all over the world that had to be performed, um, and that South Africa was completely on top of what had to be done. That the doctors knew exactly what had to be done, and they performed all those tests. So in that sense, we felt confident that we would be able to convince a court that um, we were actually on the right side of the law. Okay, questions? I have a question. Um, when the, the, the issue of liability and having a medical negligence claim is what I'm just struggling to understand. Because you're talking about in the initial stages of this lady and her brain ceased to have capacity. So she was clinically deceased. But now if you look at, for example, the unborn, unborn fetus in that is fiction, mm -hmm. their brain hasn't developed as yet. So how could you have, where, where does the medical negligence claim lie with someone that doesn't have a brain and it's, it's not yet developed, and someone that, and then you have it, you can have a medical negligence claim against the, the unborn fetus, and when someone doesn't have a medical, um, doesn't have capacity and clinically dead, that, that, that just, that just I, I just don't understand the link of how you can have claims against something that doesn't have a brain and something that has a brain but doesn't pay function anymore. And that's just the attachment of liability, that's the only aspect that I'm struggling to get a grasp on. Okay, um, the brain actually develops at the very first. Okay. Because, this is what I'm yes, so if you go and look at like fetuses that are like peanuts, mm -hmm. um, there's this huge brain and then the other is just like little bits. Okay. So, so a, a baby's brain develops, that's the first thing that actually develops and that's why you would find that a lot of women who didn't know they were pregnant in the first three months um, with fetal alcohol syndrome, all those types of um, harm is caused actually in the first three months. Uh, I'm not a doctor yet, so I'm talking just from what I understand it to be. Um, but also the brain carries on developing for a man until he's 23 and for a woman until about, <laughs> <laughs> until about 16 or 17. So the development of the male brain takes a little bit longer. <laughs> and again, I'm not a doctor. This is just from, um, from what I've learned over the years, reading a lot of stuff. But uh, so yes, so that's why a baby can be born um, even at 26 or 26 weeks or 28 weeks, I can already save them and can carry on living because there's already a brain. So what you would find in babies like that is their lungs might be compromised because it wasn't fully developed, or if there was a shortage of oxygen, that that brain that was already developed didn't get sufficient oxygen. 
So, um, for instance, in a natural birth, um, which people bang the drum for hugely, um, the baby literally um, is deprived of oxygen with every contraction. So, with every contraction, the, um, the canal squeezes and is released. And during that period where you are deprived of oxygen, it sounds a lot more dramatic than what it really is. The placenta provides that child with oxygen. If a mother has a compromised placenta, and this is really something that the doctor should know right from the start, then that compromised placenta would not be able to assist that child during, the period, during that period of um, going through the birth canal. So there are two types of those of you who do cerebral palsy will know there's two different types of cerebral palsy. There's a prolonged and then there's the partial. So a prolonged is normally when um, the baby has been struggling for a while um, and those are normally the ones that take on trial. So there was a struggle to be born and there was a drop in the baby's heart rate which is that CTG thing that everybody goes crazy about. Um, there was a lowering in blood gases. There was all kinds of stuff when the baby was born that could show you that this baby was compromised. Um, whereas a sudden incident, say for instance, they didn't notice that the baby had um, its um, string around the neck, um, you know, and now the baby's born and suddenly, you know, it can't breathe. That's different from when a baby is actually stuck in the womb it's compromised, the birth is taking too long, and that very often happens with very young mothers, um, teens, and with babies that um, where moms have underlying um, immunodeficiency disorders because their placenta is simply not strong enough to help that baby. And our hospitals don't have enough um, facilities available to give all, um, all the women that need it C-sections. Um, and that's one of the reasons I believe we have such a huge cerebral palsy problem in this country. It's not just related to um, they not being care, but um, a lot of immunocompromised women should be getting C-sections, which they don't have access to. Okay, and at what point would you know, would, would, would it be known that in fact that is what the patient requires, as opposed to natural birth? The, uh, the C-section as opposed to natural birth? I think the, um, you know, the things that I check for, and this is not just in public health, it's everywhere, um, they would check um, your general health status. So um, they would check your blood pressure because you could have a high blood pressure in a mom, it's very dangerous um, for a baby. So um, they would check your blood pressure, they would check if you have diabetes. Um, so there would be a whole host of checks that will go on your... Um, on that little chart that I give the mother right from the start. So the mother and child little chart thing, forgotten what it's called. <laughs> so, um, and every child has that, every mom has that. When she goes to the clinic, um, she, she would fill that in, they would check her blood pressure and all kinds of things like that. But to give yourself an idea, like the ideal was um, at the, in the 90s was to have a clinic every 10 kilometers from everybody's home and that was achieved there's now a clinic within 10 kilometers of every household now imagine you are going into labor 10 kilometers is like running the oh, comrades marathon you know there might be nobody in your area with a motor vehicle to take you there ambulances are not readily available so at what point when you come to the hospital how long have you not already been in birth um, you know, so by the time that mom reaches the hospital, she might already have been in labor, sorry, I said in birth, in labor for a number of hours. Um, so that is not always calculated, um, which is one of the dangers that we have with so many injuries, that by the time people actually get to triage in a public health facility, they've been in labor for ages. Um, you know, so um, although some of the places like Charlotte Turkey has a uh, mother and child ward, so I can go sp um, specifically there. Um, Baraguanov, I haven't been to Baraguanov yet, but I'm sure they do as well. So Kimberley, like most of the bigger areas. What also happens in public health, and again we have to ask ourselves if this is negligence or is it reasonable health care, is that if a mom gets to a clinic um, and they see that she has a compromised birth, she has to be moved 
to one of the bigger health facilities. So again, now she might be waiting an hour or two for an ambulance to arrive, or she might be lucky that she has somebody that can take her there. Now she goes, for instance, say, from a little village in the Northern Cape, she now has to be transported to Kimberley because that's her closest um, hospital in her area that can deal with a compromised uh, birth. So, you know, we're looking now already at maybe 24 hours that that mother has been in labor. So, so by the time we start suing the hospitals, we need to actually look at the progression um, of that labor right from when you get that little booklet. And that's one of your most important things to have is to see what happened during that mother's pregnancy. Did she go regularly wash? Did she have a checkup? How far was she from the hospital? Did she have the ability to have uh, to get transport to take her there? When she was there, was there a problem um, at the clinic? Maybe the clinic wasn't open, it was in the middle of the night, so she had to go to another hospital. Was it in the same province? Because you're not allowed to move provinces. So to give you an example, if you are injured in, um, I had a case for the Department of Health in Mahakeng where um, the person had to be moved to Barabwana. They couldn't go <laughs> to Pach or Clarksdorf. Sure. They had to go all the way to Barabwana. Um, you know, my dad, I've used public health facilities all my life, so my dad fell ill in Paris and I couldn't bring him to Joburg because he had to go to Bloemfontein. <laughs> <laughs> so I had to sign a form to say I'm removing him from the hospital with no further care because it was closer for me to take him to Joburg. So there's those departmental issues that are also compromising the ability to quickly care for somebody and take them to a facility closer to them where they can get better care. There are some of the private hospital groups that are trying hard to work with the department in assisting them in smaller areas um, to um, assist them when there's compromised births and stuff like that. But yeah, until such time, um, we are basically need more midwives by far, and um, we don't need more gynecologists, even though they would tell you we do, or obstetricians, because um, in the old days, um, the majority of babies were born with a midwife or a nurse or the GP. You know, we've only become addicted to specializations in our modern age. But, um, you know, so I would say training for GPs, tra more training more midwives. Um, take the nurses, for instance, that move around um, in the villages that admi administer HIV medication or look after HIV patients. You know, they are already there in those facilities. Why not upskill up them and train them to also be midwives? So there's a lot of things we can do to try and alleviate the burden moms have to giving birth when it's a compromised birth, and especially very young kids. And um, if it's your first child, they've actually got a special name for you if you're a first child, <laughs> Premi Gravidus. That's how compromised you are just by giving birth for the first time because you don't know how to do it. <laughs> it does not come naturally, trust me. <laughs> you need help. <laughs> so, okay, any other questions? Sorry, I went away off your topic there. <laughs> so, in that instance, would you get a full claim uh, from the road accident fund or? if you sue the hospital as well, or would it be would there be some sort of apportionment of damage? On um, the, if you wish to, and that is something unfortunately that we don't see in road accident fund claims, is that very few attorneys are interested in suing a hospital where there was clear negligence. In this case, um, if they do try, I don't think they'll be successful against the doctor in the hospital. Um, because there's a very long list of attempts I've made uh, to assist um, uh, this lady. Um, the claim would be then exclusively against the road accident fund. Uh, the fact that she passed away or that costs were incurred in um, a private health facility would not be something that could hold against um, the family. So um, that claim will be, in my mind, successful in terms of liability. Obviously, um, there would still be the other aspects of liability in a road accident fund claim um, that we normally deal with. You know, was she a passenger, was she driving, all kinds of stuff like that. So all that stuff, but the nexus is clearly there. She didn't pass away and didn't land up in the hospital from anything other than the accident. What we often see in road accident fund matters, which as I say is unfortunately not something 
that attorneys deal with is that they um, they actually the patient would this actually happened to this lady. She was uh, she went to hospital after the accident, and um, they discharged her like they normally do within half a day. You know, made sure cursory glance to see if she was okay. She was discharged, and she was then a week later. The family realized now there's something seriously wrong. So they then took her to the uh, private health facility. Um, I can't remember exactly the reason for that. It might have been the closest, or maybe they managed to get some money together for a deposit or something like that. But when she got there, she, she had become a lot more compromised. And during the course of that first week of her admission there, um, the indication was that um, she, was, um, she was dying. So, um, so yeah, we don't know if, if she had been diagnosed correctly at the first half facility, um, if that could have saved her life, but um, that would certainly be something that they could investigate um, whichever attorney takes this on. Okay. So if you just to answer that, often what you see, for instance, is uh, take an example, if somebody drives over um, an unprotected crossing, and the um, the traffic light is not functioning uh, because it was and it hasn't been functioning for months or the stop street um, there was there's no stop street or there's no lines in the road now they cross into that intersection and there's an accident surely it's not only the road accident fund that's liable mm -hmm. because the actual accident was actually caused by um, an incident that the whole nexus is there from there was no line, there was no stripe, you know, so who do you blame in an instance like that? So to apportion any of those two people's claims would, in my view, be very unfair and unreasonable. So you really should look at instituting action against the department or the municipality that was in charge of that particular section of the road. Take a pothole, you swerve, um, I had a client like that once, that swerved for a pothole, you know, and took out like the car coming from the front. And um, yeah, remember that I sent you the picture board so you can send it on to everybody. But the picture he drew on the OIR made it look like, um, yeah, the Kimberley's hole. <laughs> so, when we, <laughs> so when we got to court and, you know, the judge was looking at this, I thought, oh, we have problems here now because not to explain. <laughs> This whole, yeah, so, um, but that was his version of how he saw um, the danger and swerved and ended up um, causing an accident. So that's what's called an accident. Mm -hmm. Very few of us deliberately want to crash into somebody. Yeah. Although my 18 year old son that I'm now teaching to, for his learner's driver, <laughs> I might disagree with you on that when you've been in the car with him a few times. Okay. Well, what what sort of advice would you give to a young practitioner coming into the profession having done pupillage and wish to explore this part of our law as a practice area uh, insofar as uh, the dealing with medical negligence related matters or wanting to pursue it uh, from from being able to to crystallize in his or her own mind what the cause of action is and who's liable, whether it's delictual, etc. I think um, more than any other type of law, uh, clinical negligence requires a lot of self-study. And um, you can start your learning already by just um, reading through cases, um, for instance, on road accident fund matters. And you need to you need to uh, start with the habit to actually Google every medical term and look what it is. Create a little dictionary for yourself. There are dictionaries that you get that explain medical terms, but um, you know. So, for instance, um, a debridement. I had an opponent that thought a debridement was a bruise, and I'm like, near chum. A debridement is like they actually cut out pieces of this person's foot. Um, because they were dead skin cells and you know, so his foot probably does not look so nice anymore You know, or you get people who think a soft tissue injury is a bruise. It's not It just means you didn't break a bone. You know, you've ripped your ligaments off 
you know, or it's, uh, to a certain extent have stretched the legal limits. So there's a lot of terms that we use every day in court that people don't actually um, understand. A very experienced um, road accident fund attorney said to me once that my client had a pre-existing condition after an ankle break. And I said, what was that? And she said, he has a vulgar, vulgar deformity. I think it's vulgar or vulgar. Yeah, vulgar deformity. And I'm like, that's a bunion. You know, so, <laughs> you know so, so if you don't actually go and sit and read up every medical word that is used. Um, so for instance, when we study law and they use terminology, eventually it starts rolling off our tongues. And how do we learn that? By reading case law and they force that down your throat already at varsity. So if you're interested in medical negligence, make yourself a file. I did that when I started. Um, I went and I looked up all the medical negligence case law. I printed it out. I put it in a file for myself and I would read through them to learn the terminology, the doctors that you use. Because that's another thing. Um, um, it's actually an article that I also wrote ages ago on if you have the correct medical expert. Because often people would go to court and they would have an orthopedic surgeon, um, but the orthopedic surgeon might not be a shoulder specialist. Or they'll have an orthopedic surgeon for a knee injury when that orthopedic surgeon only does shoulders. You know, so in medical negligence, those subspecialities become very important. You can't use the same guys you use that are deal with trauma in road accident fund matters. You need a super specialist for every type of injury. Like there's a pediatric pulmonologist as opposed to a normal pulmonologist. There's, um, you know, a neurologist instead of a neurosurgeon. And this is one of the mistakes that you always see in court of road accident fund matters. They would say there is no brain injury because the neurosurgeon didn't find anything. This lady is a very good example of what happens if you rely only on the ability to visualize an injury in the brain. A brain can be injured without any visual, um, uh, visible signs right in the beginning. We know that from children with cerebral palsy as well. They actually determine if negligence um, was present at birth by looking at the size of the injury um, from when the MRI was taken. So they can actually determine the size of that fallout, which is like a little white crater. Or it, it's a flare that becomes, the brain literally melts because it moves into those areas where that hole has formed. And um, that section, um, you can see in an MRI for even and ever in a day. Um, you know, so it reminds them from that, I can determine the amount of days because it can take nine to 14 days for that to show up. So, so that's why if you go to a neurosurgeon and he says, okay, if you can actually, if a neurosurgeon can see a brain injury, that person is probably non compos you know, so, so he can pick up on maybe, um, you know, they were a skull fracture or there was something like that. But the actual finer details of fallout is, um, is much more, and that's why we need clinical psychologists. And one of the first neurosurgeons that actually started pushing for that was Dr. Martin Luer Allen, and then Dr. Hermann Edling followed on that. But there's also now, um, there's defendant, um, like, um, I've forgotten his name now, Okidi, Okidi from Pretoria, that's also, um, relies quite heavily on what the neuropsychologists have found in fallout. But it's very difficult to determine, especially children who come from um, tier three schools or school non fee paying schools, because um, they might not have had the type of education um, so that when they go for a neuropsychological test, that neuropsychological test might not be able to determine um, what their knowledge was before and after the accident. So then it becomes a guessing game. Um, there's actually a guy that's doing research on that now. I'm very, very excited about that. He's doing his master's degree on um, mild traumatic brain injuries um, and specifically how the courts deal with it, how the neuropsychologists deal with it. If you, if you ever get a case like that, please go and look at the World Health Organization's um, guidelines on um, minor brain injuries. Um, it is something that um, our doctors in South Africa do not refer to. The only doctor I've ever seen refer to that was Dr. Earl. Um, and for that reason, I then went and I looked at the WHO's guidelines on, 
um, minor traumatic brain injuries. And there they give you a very long list of stuff you can look at if you're doing a case like that where they explain to you um, what um, fallout is. Uh, personality changes, you know, if the wife tells you, now he was perfectly fine before the accident, now suddenly he wants to black some everybody, you know, then, then you must start wondering, you know, has something not happened here? You know, he's, he was good with money, now he's suddenly a big spender. You know, so there's a shift in personality with these very minor brain injuries. The guy looks perfectly fine from the outside and you can't see anything on his scan, but, um, but yeah. Any further questions? Uh, from, from our online audience, Nino, any questions from you, Paul? Paul Lance? Uh, Nino? I'm old. <laughs> <laughs> I, okay. right, I actually, sorry, I actually have a question. Okay. Um, uh, Bart is actually quite correct in your, with regards to your expertise. Um, I'm actually going to have you on speed dial if ever I get sick. <laughs> <laughs> My, I want to bring, I want to bring you back to the constitutionality with regards to it. And you mentioned that reasonable healthcare mm -hmm. is enshrined within the constitution. So my first question is pertaining to how do we determine that? I find that to be very open-ended and vague. One, uh, my, that's my first question. My second question is pertaining to a J88. Now, in terms of a J88 form, many, uh, we've had many, and I'm sure you've realized this, many instances of alleged assault and mm -hmm assaults that, that have not happened or has happened, how do, how, how do the courts or uh, the courts for that matter rely upon the J88? And uh, sorry, the last thing is yeah. where can we find your article? LinkedIn. Okay. <laughs> but I'll send it to Bart as well and he can pass it on to everybody. Okay, just in terms of constitutionality, there's a very interesting case that comes out of the UK um, those of you who are interested in medical negligence, the Oxford Medical Law Journal has got some amazing articles. They cost an absolute arm and a leg, but they do have free ones. Um, otherwise, you'll need 20 people to help you pay that 50 pounds. <laughs> because, um, you know, but there are articles on there that are free, and you can read the abstract for free, which normally is quite long, and gives you an indication of other research you need to go and look at. But that's an absolutely amazing, in actual fact, when I started doing medical negligence, um, how long ago is this now? Uh, 10, 12 years ago, um, I used to order medical law books from, on Amazon from the UK um, to be able to have access to international cases and stuff on, on medical, uh, medical law. But yes, to answer your question about reasonableness and me diverting, um, there was a case in the UK um, that I came across reading the Oxford Medical Law Journal, um, which dealt with the whole system of the reasonable patient versus the reasonable doctor. And reasonableness, as you all know, in delict is determined on the reasonable person. It used to be man for a very long, and I still think those are different. A reasonable woman versus a reasonable man. So, um, so the reasonable person um, is, um, is something that the UK has now in the interim thrown out. They no longer use the reasonable um, doctor as a, sorry, not person, reasonable doctor to determine if medical um, treatment was fair and reasonable. They use the reasonable patient. And um, that case, um, I think I've quoted it in one of my articles, I'll just check for you. But it was Lancashire, if I remember correctly, Lancashire Hospital. And what happened in this instance is they said that even if the doctor feels that he has given you sufficient information, if the patient feels they did not have sufficient information, they can still be negligence. Now, as you guys know, um, those of you who have read about medical negligence, we have an ancient old case called uh, Van Dyke versus Lewis in which negligence in South Africa was determined. In other words, um, it was determined that if you cannot find, um, if you find that even if the patient had known um, what would happen to them, and subsequently they sustained um, a complication or an adverse outcome, 
um, that's a topic for another day because there's a difference between those three, um, then um, they, they would not be entitled to claim negligence. So if they consented to all the aspects that the doctor felt was reasonable to tell them, their negligence falls away. But it doesn't always work. And I try to argue this matter um, in the high court but you know i from the beginning knew we would have to go to the constitutional court but unfortunately my attorney did not have the appetite to take it all the way there even though i thought we had an excellent case because if you look at the consent forms that people complete especially in public health facilities um they actually do not know what they're signing for um you know they have absolutely no idea and this came about with one client that i had who thought she had calcium because she had a thyroid problem. She actually had a paradectomy. So these are the glands, like tiny little glands that are even behind your thyroid glands. So, so when they tested her, they saw that her calcium was highly elevated. She had various other problems that indicated that she required a paradectomy. But they only, the only part that like sort of she um, understood was that there was a problem with her calcium. She then goes to the operating theatre and now they're digging around. They first of all give her a local anaesthetic, which you don't do with a paradectomy. And um, she's lying there, eyes wide awake, scared like witless because she doesn't un understand why they are messing around in her throat when she's only got a problem with calcium. She then later on loses her voice, which is a very common fallout when you have that type of operation and it recovers within six weeks or so. Um, but there is the possibility that it would never recover in full. She was never told this. So now she doesn't understand why she also now cannot speak. You can imagine this lady's trauma. So, so now if you say that that consent form, she consented to this operation, they explain to her whatever they might have explained, she's gonna go for anesthetics, but she had no clue, you know? So surely even if that operation was found to have no complication, and that's what the doctor said. They said that the complication, or rather there was a complication, but it was no negligence. Everybody agreed there wasn't negligence, but surely this lady should have recourse to the law because she was traumatized by this whole experience. She wasn't explained in full what's going to happen with the operation and that's where the reasonable patient comes in versus the reasonable doctor. Um, imagine that lady was a sales lady because I've had two cases like that. In another matter, uh, my client was a sales lady. So if that lady is a sales lady and she is not told that you are going to lose your voice for at least six weeks, but it could also take up to six months and in some cases a year. Do you think she would have said, I want to do this operation? She would have said, what else can we do? No, 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 I don't want this. Inject me with collagen or something. You know, I don't want to, I don't want to do this. You know, or in this particular case, um, it was a discectomy that was done from the frontal entrance instead of the back. So she, if I had told her that, she might have said, no, I'd rather have a longer recovery period because I need my voice. So again, a reasonable patient versus reasonable doctor. And I'm very eager to argue that in our courts, but I haven't had the opportunity yet. So please go, um, I'll send that to you as well, but uh, that particular case about, so that's where reasonableness comes in. It's, for me, reasonableness is not objective any longer because we are too mixed of a crowd. You know, it, it needs to be, we say the objective doctor, the objective patient. But an objective patient that is also a doctor versus an objective patient who doesn't understand any English. So where does objectivity, so there has to be a measure of subjectivity um, to that decision if it was actually for a person in, and, and the law does say, a person in that specific instance, in that specific, with that specific education, but do we actually take it into consideration? Um, okay, I remember the Jaya Adi Aitok question. <laughs> um, they are actually, doctors are actually able to tell you exactly how an injury came about. Um, if you've watched CSI, you would know that I can actually determine by how an injury was caused uh, to a very close possibility of how the injury occurred. Like for instance, um, in a motor vehicle accident, um, your neck goes like this 
at a certain speed, your neck would go like this differently. And if you're hit from the side, your neck would like rotate. I'm also like just guessing, you know, but you get the idea. It will be, there would be certain movements that a doctor will be able to say, okay, how, how was the accident caused? Um, where were you sitting? Did you have um, your belt on? And then from that, I will be able to determine, okay, what I'm looking at here is on a balance of probabilities for us. But for them, there's a possibility that this would have been caused um, by the injury in question. So if somebody says I've been assaulted, um, you know, and they might have fallen down the stairs, um, you know, the break will probably look different from one that happened um, if they were hit by um, a blunt instrument. Um, it might be a break in a different place. It might be, um, you know, so because you guys that or I'm saying you guys, I'm sure everybody at some point has done a road accident for matter. But we all know what those breaks look like. You know, we all know it's almost follows a, a routine pattern. Um, you know, we can start reciting those injuries off by heart. So now you suddenly get another type of break and now it's different. So how did this happen? Um, and in assault cases, you need to make sure then that you have an expert that can distinguish between um, how that injury actually occurred. The problem would be if that injury goes away, you know, at a later stage, but then isn't that problem both ways? because then there should be absolution because there's not sufficient evidence. Or you have um, uh, to obstruct the versions, you know, um, and then it relies on the witnesses. So there's ways and means of getting around it. Um, but if there is a possibility to identify uh, the injury that was sustained, say a guy was hit on the head and he had a skull fracture, um, I would say that an experienced orthopedic surgeon or neurosurgeon would be able to tell you if that skull fracture was a traumatic brain injury or if he had just fallen down the stairs, which is also traumatic, but it might have a different injury. <laughs> you have to fall very far to crack your skull, <laughs> although you never know. Might be a person with compromised skull. <laughs> That's what makes clinical negligence and any kind of personal injury so interesting because we never know. What was the other question? You had three. Your articles. Oh, yes, on LinkedIn and um, if you don't have LinkedIn, please do get it. It's like the Facebook of business. So, yeah. And for those of you who asked um, about how they learn about this, um, you can actually follow um, the hashtag medical malpractice. You can follow clinical negligence and then you'll get a lot of articles and stuff from across the world that will come up in your inbox. Um, so you can actually um, determine what you want to read and follow. Um, and you can follow attorney firms that do that kind of stuff or private attorneys and yeah, the American ones are a little bit, but I have long videos on YouTube on, on stuff that we use here as well. YouTube's fantastic. If you want to learn how they do um, a specific operation, you just go and, and search for that particular video. Um, I did a matter where it was, um, um, a particular type of um, section of the stomach that had to be removed and I was defending the doctor and I found videos on YouTube on how you do it. And I just watched the video and it explains to you in detail how the operation took place. So self-study, clinical negligence, as I said, uh, personal injury, um, at least two-thirds of your preparation is self-study. And buy a good book if you do a lot of motor vehicle accidents, you need an anatomy book on orthopedic surgery. And you need, um, if you need to do cerebral palsy, you need an obstetric sand book. Um, so don't just search for your books in legal libraries. Also go Elsevier, which is the South African, um, it's an international publisher. Um, but on there you get a whole different lot of um, of medical books um, and attach sketches for the judges so that you can show them because um, it's easier to visualize something. Um, I once settled the case because I realized that the trocar could actually puncture the guy's heart when I was sitting there. I was like, and we were ready to go on trial and I'm suddenly looking at the sketch and I said to the expert, but how did this thing get there? And he said to me, oh, he must have jumped on it. And I'm like, oh, so I called my dad. 
<laughs> did we have to see all He said, why? I said, because I just realized something I didn't know before, you know, so, yeah, so that's, a, yeah. yeah, so you learn as you go along. And don't believe everything doctors tell you, please, go and do your own research. No, honestly, how are you? I'm very well, thanks. Sorry, I'm late. No, I wanted to ask. What happens in a situation where um, the, your client will tell you that uh, my hospital records were about this big and there were two volumes. When I had to go back to retrieve something from them, the second volume that was this big is suddenly this big. Mm -hmm. um, well, I can tell you from um, hospital records that there's a huge amount of duplication. So if you, any of you that have seen uh, public health records that have just been scanned through, um, there's so many patients, pa uh, pages that have been duplicated. Um, so it could be that they um, remove the duplications, um, especially more likely in private health facilities, but it could also be that, um, you know, I don't want to say everybody goes around stealing records, um, which does not seem likely, but it could be that the doctor maybe wanted to save his own notes um, in a separate place, or I don't know how these things work, but um, if, if it is a private health facility, it's as important for the medical professionals and the hospital to have access to all those records than it is for the plaintiff. So, um, and I think that is something that public health has realized over the years, the importance of actually proper record keeping. Um, because if you don't have proper records, then you really cannot disprove a claim. And then you're sitting with a situation where, you know, a doctor can come and say, okay, this and this and this is likely to have happened, and you've got nothing to counter that with. Um, you know, so if a mom, for instance, walks into a hospital at, eight o'clock in the morning and she doesn't go immediately to triage which happens all the time um, you know and now she's finally seen 24 hours later and now there's no gynae till the next day and no obstetrician till the next day so now we're already in 36 hours none of that you will find on the records so when you speak to the clients um, or when you take an opportunity to get the full story um, which is really why we need mediation is because it gives everybody the opportunity to tell the full story. So you might sit there as defendant counsel all huffed and puffed because you don't think this woman is telling the truth. And then you go and sit in a mediation and suddenly you realize this lady was actually in labor for two or three days, but she was only recorded to have entered the ward at say um, nine o'clock in the morning because that's the time that she managed to get to the front of the queue. Um, you know, so there's all, that's ambulance records in motor vehicle accidents. Um, you know, they would say to you, yeah, but the patient wasn't unconscious. Meantime, the dude's awake already because the ambulance took two hours to get there. <laughs> you know, so, so the guy would say to you, oh, when I only remember from when the ambulance got there, what time was the accident and what time did the ambulance arrive? If that was two hours, that means that guy was unconscious for two hours. Well, at least for two hours, he didn't know what was happening around him. You know, so those records are just as important. You have to start right from the beginning to prove an injury. You can't just take what you are given. You need to ask, you need to say to your attorney, I need this and this and this. Which ambulance brought this guy to the hospital? Um, you know, what was the pre-existing conditions for a baby? Where's the antenatal clinic card? Um, where's the mother's uh, birth chart? You know, bring all those things to me in defendant and plaintiff work. Then I can look at all of it together and get a complete picture. Um, you know how I decided um, to, um, for one a firm that I helped with the clinical negligence cases, how I would decide if a matter is worth pursuing in cerebral palsy is to look at the mother's records, to ask the mother how long she was in birth, and um, then to um, do an MRI. If you've got those three things, things then you can institute action, not before that because those are the three things that will determine if there was fallout. So get all your background information first. And if you do clinical negligence, make sure you have um, a doctor's report before you institute action, if you're a plaintiff, and if you're a defendant, make sure that you've read that doctor's report before you defend instead of settling. And make sure at the mediation, you listen to what people are saying. And what if there's perhaps suspected foul play that maybe documents
units were removed because doctors realized that they might have acted negligently and to sort of hide trails and traces and mm -hmm. hospital records are suddenly pinched or have gone missing. Yeah. You'll see in um, in private health what they do now, I know that some of the hospitals do it. Um, that they now have two columns. One is where the nurse also indicates they have an additional column that you didn't always used to be there, where the nurse actually record the doctor's arrival, how long he spent and any instructions and discussions they have. So it's highly unlikely that the hospital will get rid of that. Um, you know, and if they do to protect themselves, then the doctor will have his notes. Because remember in, other than in public health, um, all the notes go on one document. In the private health, the doctor has his own notes and the nurses have their own notes. So you must get the doctor's notes as well as the nurse's notes, which will be on the hospital records. And sometimes I type it on a computer, like some of the hospital groups um, would make written notes, but then they would go and make further notes on a computerized system. So, and those notes might not be exactly the same because the nurse might be writing quickly what she needs to write there, and then she goes to the computer and she now types up everything she remembers because she might now have five minutes to actually do it. Um, doctor's clinical notes, your anesthesiologist will have notes. Uh, normally they write a short little note after the operation at the top. In public health, you'll find it there. But um, in private health, the, the anesthesiologist, um, the um, orthopedic surgeon, whoever was involved in the operation will make their own notes. They will have their own patient file. So, so that's why you will be able to construct what happened if you have everyone's notes. And also remember, public health uses consultants who are in the big hospitals, so they're professors um, that teach. So in Chontkeki, in Baragwana, um, UNITAS, all the teaching hospitals, you should have notes from the consultants as well. So in, in the big uh, teaching hospitals, you might find so many information, so much information that keeps being repeated because one set of doctors will come in the morning and do all the tests. Then the next set of doctors will come and do all the tests. And that's why I always reckon you are in very good hands if you go to a teaching hospital because there's like 20 doctors that come and check you all the time to see if you're still alive. You know, so it's very hard for you for anything to happen to you in a teaching hospital. So, thank you. Okay. Thank you. I think that the only thing that remains for us to thank you for your time. My uh, pleasure. As we've indicated earlier, we're going to develop a collaborative relationship with your group and uh, uh, invite you over at some point again in future uh, to address us. Thank you so much for those who attended online and virtually and those who are viewing the, the video online. Thank you again. Thank, thank you. you.